Okay, you guys can start. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank everybody for who's already on, and I know there will be others who will be joining us. We had over 100 people who actually RSVP'd, so there are a lot of people who are very interested in what our expert panelists has to say this evening. Um, we're excited about it because, um, as we know, this is a very important issue. It is the top issue, not only in DC or for KIPP, but our nation. Um, and so with that being said, I want to welcome everybody to tonight um, and make sure that we also understand what the agenda is going to be and why we're here. So if we can go to the next uh, slide. All well, the technical difficulties today. One second. <laughs> And that's okay, we understand that this stuff happens along the way. So as I said, I wanna uh, welcome everybody. My name is Jacques Patterson, I'm the Chief Community Engagement and Growth Officer for KIPP DC. Um, and I, I love the position that I serve for the mere fact that I am an East of the River resident. Um, it is very important to me that I make sure that communities such as mine, um, East of the River, that we get the information out that needs to be to our community so that they can be better served. A lot of times we are underserved and don't get the things that we need or we're marginalized. And so the um, objective is kind of like why we're here. We can go to why we're here. Um, why we're here is basically to talk about the vaccine, coronavirus, why it's important for us to know what we, what we need to know. There is, we know historically that our communities are skeptical about vaccines about things as this, because we know what has happened to us historically, whether we're talking about Tuskegee and other incidences where the, the black community, the BIPOC community has not been well served, not even when science was involved. But we do know that we are facing an unprecedented pandemic in our lifetime, it has not happened in over a hundred some years, and that we need the clear facts so that we can make sure that our community is safe, um, that our children are safe, and as we can make intelligent decisions on about what we're gonna be our next moves. So that's why I'm happy to be here um, and happy to be hosting this, so to speak, of these experts that are here tonight. And with that, I'm gonna go through just a few more things. Um, I wanna talk about our guiding principles real quick. We can go to the next slide. Our guiding principles are, are simply this, uh, just prioritizing safety, health, and the well-being of our entire school community our students, our staff, our alumni, and our family. And we see this as the last word said, this is all our family. KIPP is, is everything to me. My daughter is a teacher within KIPP and um, this is a guiding principle. We're ensuring that KIPP DC students and alumni thrive despite the circumstances that we're in, these unprecedented circumstances with sufficient access to academic material, the technology, the remote instructions, the mental health services, the food scarcity that some of our, our communities are experiencing that we address those issues. We wanna make sure that we have the right community resources that are, as our families struggle through some of the financial difficulties that they're going through and the support on the network. And if we can go to the next slide as well. And this is KIPP DC's vaccine policy. Um, I do want you to know that um, at KIPP we have uh, been for quite some time, but we're really getting into it is our in-person learning. Um, there are teachers back helping our most at-risk students and those students and, and parents who have said, I needed my child to be back for in-person instruction. And that we have started the vaccination process for all of our teachers and those who are coming in contact with them. So for with our students though, uh, with, no, with no childhood um, vaccine available, KIPP DC will not be requiring students to receive one to participate in in-person learning. Once a, once a childhood vaccine becomes available, we will follow public health guidance and update families. For our staff, as I said, at this time, staff working in in-person are not required to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. However, we are highly um, recommending, encouraging them to do so. As I said, we have, I literally have pictures on my phone of how many teachers that are going in since it's been made available for teachers. Uh, to go in and get get their vaccine because we highly recommend this um, to make sure that we reach that, that point where we have herd immunity and we, we can stop this spread that is going on and devastating our communities. With that being said, um, 
I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Ambrose Lane to do kind of the introductions and take it from here. Um, and uh, Shakima will help him out as, as we go through any slides that we need to do. But I'm just going to turn this over to our experts. Uh, Mr. Ambrose Lane knows these guys well, and he's going to do a great job. And I'm going to be right here listening, and I may have a few questions for you as we go through this, so, or, or highlight some of the questions that may come through the chat. So take it away, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Zach and uh, Jacques, and, and I really appreciate uh, both yourself and uh, Mr. Best for inviting me and inviting the Black Coalition Against COVID uh, to make this presentation to uh, your parents and teachers. Um, since uh, April, the Black Coalition Against COVID has been uh, really on the front lines trying to educate our communities both locally in the DC and the DMV and nationally uh, through a number of, of webinars and, and WebExes and Zoom calls. Um, we have also been working with the Depart DC Department of Health on some, on some issues regarding vaccines as, as well as vaccine acceptance um, and, and other issues in terms of uh, contact tracing as well. So uh, I am a co-founder of the Black Coalition is COVID, but I really wanna introduce uh, the brain trust and the and the and, and the man behind pulling us all together, and that is Dr. Reed Tuxen. Dr. Reed Tuxen, uh, not only a co-founder and steering committee member um, of the Black Coalition Against COVID, but he was also the former uh, DC Health Department uh, chair of the DC Health Department. And so uh, I am glad to introduce him, and he will take it away. Well, thank you uh, very much, Ambrose. And again, for behalf of all of us at the Black Coalition Against COVID, we wanna thank you for the opportunity to, to be servants to each and every one of you. Um, as I indicate, as, as Ambrose indicated, uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm really pr privileged to serve alongside uh, my colleagues, Ambrose and Dr. Melissa Clark, from whom you'll be hearing in a moment also. We did begin our work uh, in April. Uh, and it became largely because of my experience as having been the, uh, as Ambrose mentioned, the commissioner of health in DC during the height of the AIDS epidemic in the middle, in the late eighties. Uh, what we learned from that experience is that it is not possible to fight these kinds of overwhelming health challenges only from government, that there has to be uh, also a robust community-based uh, uh, presence as well. And so we are, um, we have been working really hard to, to, to do the bottom up while the government, which is doing, I think, a commendable job, uh, is working from the top down. And so we're sort of meeting in the middle. Um, our efforts have been really focused on uh, getting community influencers, those who have the voice of credibility and the voice of, of legitimacy within multiple segments of our community, whether it's the faith community, whether it is the incarcerated returning community, whether it is our community-based organizations, whether it is the faith community, whether it is our musicians, artists, poets, across the board, organized labor, all of those entities uh, are part of what we're trying to do as we try to create a culture within our community life that fights for our survival, that pushes us to do the right things. We are particularly pleased that we could be engaged in innovative things that helped early in the pandemic to encourage people to wear their masks. And by the way, if there is any one of you on this call now who doesn't understand how absolutely important it is that you wear your mask every time you go out, please let me beg and plead with you. One of my uh, things that our colleagues will be talking about will be some of the mutations that we are seeing in this uh, virus. And so as you hear that conversation, hear it with the ears that say, okay, I got it. I now know I need to double down on masking, double down on, on physical distancing, double down on, on, um, on, on making sure that I'm not indoors and I'm definitely not gonna be indoors with people who do not live with me. So those are gonna be key things. We have augmented our work as we have gone forward with urging people to do the basic fundamentals that I mentioned but we became very uh, 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 concerned early on about the importance of getting the community to be accepting of vaccines. And we, in that regard, pulled together um, the four historically black medical schools, Howard, Meharry, Morehouse, and Charles Drew in LA, combined with the National Medical Association and the National Black Nurses Association into one 
coordinated army of black expertise in, in healthcare, all of our best geniuses in healthcare from the black community. And we have made that coalition part of the Black Coalition Against COVID and have been speaking now with the voice of authority, not only in DC, but across the country. We have been very privileged to, I think now become the national resource for anyone doing work um, to reach the, you know, our community uh, in, this, in this era. And so we're very proud that we have been holding uh, national town halls that are being broadcast locally, but those national town halls have been reaching 300,000 people around the country in addition to the numerous people in DC. And so we will continue uh, to be that servant, to be guiding going forward. I will conclude my comments by predicating or predicting what some of my colleagues are going to talk about. And as they talk about the mutations, as they talk about uh, vaccine uh, 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 availability, I really wanna make sure that we are begging each and every one of you to not be in that category of the conspiracy theory people, those who are so focused on, uh, there's a whole segment of people in our community that were really almost rooting against the vaccine for working. We're about to go to 500,000 deaths in this country in the next couple of weeks. By February 13th, we will probably hit 500,000. Um, the alternative to the vaccine is to go to 600, 700, 800,000. There has to be an end game here. And so we are in a position uh, to have examined the data on the safety of these vaccines. We've had a chance to examine the leaders who have uh, produced them and who have reviewed them. And my colleagues will give you that information. Uh, but I would just urge each and every one of you to realize that if we keep looking backward, we will die in the future. We have got to be current at this historical moment and realize that at every step along the way in this COVID vaccine uh, uh, journey, that African-American physician leaders have been involved at every step from the basic science lab uh, that is producing the vaccines all the way through to the approval and review process. This is not Tuskegee, 2021 is not 1930. And we need to remember that and stop letting conspiracy theory people push us back to our own death and demise. My colleagues will expand on these comments and good luck to you. Thank you for being such good parents. Thank you for seeking information. And above all, thank you for being intelligent enough to seek out the facts as opposed to the nonsense that you see so often on our social media. With that, Ambrose, um, I know that you and uh, Melissa Clark will, will, will dive deeper into each of these areas. Absolutely. And uh, many thanks to Dr. Reed Tuxen, uh, who was the brain, the, the brain behind the Black Coalition Against COVID. Um, and, and we just thank him for his, his foresight in, in bringing us all together in what we are trying to do for the Black community. And so um, without further ado, uh, let me uh, also just share some things with you uh, in terms of uh, the work that I do as well with the Black Coalition Against COVID. Uh, as I mentioned before, my name is Ambrose Lane Jr. and I am the chair of the Health Alliance Network, which is DC's largest community-based health advocacy group. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what is happening in DC, so far there have been uh, throughout this ordeal, uh, 895 deaths uh, in the District of Columbia. Um, there have been 35,000, almost 36,000 positive cases of coronavirus in DC. And there have been almost 400,000 district residents tested uh, for coronavirus. And so uh, we are at the point where we are now, we, we had a spike in coronavirus positive rates <clears throat> just as, 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 as much as a week and a half ago. Those rates seem to be coming down. I know that the district is gonna be observing to see whether or not they come down more, but that was basically due to the spike that happened right after the Christmas and New Year holiday. Um, you know, we, we, we didn't exactly social distance. We didn't exactly uh, wear masks uh, during the Christmas holiday. So there was a spike right after Christmas and now it seems to be going down just a little bit. Uh, my work with the Black Coalition uh, involves connecting uh, many of the things that we do nationally with many of the things that we do locally. 
Uh, we are connected to several community-based organizations in and around DC, including uh, the Anacostia Coordinating Council, uh, the faith and clergy leaders uh, in and around the city, and we are informing them as well. And that is why we are in front of you. Um, I am a Ward 7 resident. Uh, I'm a father. Uh, my son goes to school in Ward 7. Um, and Brandon reached out to me because uh, he knew of the work that the Health Alliance Network and the Black Coalition were doing, but also because I know his mother. I've worked with his mother, May Best, uh, at the East River Family Strengthening Collaborative, and I'm, I'm very well known in my community because I am involved in my community. So I applaud all of you for being on this call and, and, and being connected. So we will figure out ways to get through this, everyone. Uh, in addition to some of the things that Reed had mentioned, uh, we have had uh, several events like a mask wearing contest among our young people. Uh, we have produced uh, public service announcements, both on WPFW radio as well as WHUR radio uh, about mask wearing, and it, it's serious. Now, Dr. Clark, um, who is renowned in the district uh, for her expertise, We'll talk more about the specifics of the virus and the specifics about the vaccine, but it is very important uh, that if you have any questions or any doubts about the vaccine, uh, that you follow the science and not the politics of it, uh, not the uh, misinformation that is out there, but to follow the science about it. And, and that's very important uh, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. I was just on a call where people are talking about the death of Hank Aaron. No, Hank Aaron did not die of COVID-19. Um, even though he did take the vaccine, it had nothing to do with his death. Um, and so, you know, these are the types of rumors and, and the misinformation that is out there. Um, one thing I also wanted to say about why African Americans are so <clears throat> reticent or, 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 or just fearful of taking the vaccine because of the mistrust. Naturally speaking, because of the years of the treatment of African Americans, we mistrust government. Um, it isn't just because of uh, uh, the Tuskegee experiment in the 1930s. It isn't just because of what you may have hear, heard about Henrietta Lacks. It comes from slavery. It comes from the miscarriage of justice in our justice system. Uh, it comes from police brutality that led all the way up to Black Lives Matter. It came from the targeting of our African-American leadership like Dr. King and Malcolm X and others, Megar Evers. Uh, in the 60s and 70s. And so we have a very um, uh, healthy distrust of our government um, because we see the imbalances and we see the inequities on an everyday basis. Uh, but I wanna encourage you to look past that because as Reed said, this is not 1930 anymore. There are prominent African-Americans in science and in medicine that will make sure that, that African-American communities and Latino communities will not be taken advantage of by someone who wants to do something that's unscrupulous. So get look past that, trust, trust the black scientists, trust the black medical professionals uh, on the science of the vaccines because we absolutely need to take this vaccine. Um, as I said, if, if, you, if you need information on, on myself, the Black Coalition Against COVID, or the Health Alliance Network, I will put my number in the chat. But without further ado, so that we can get to your questions, I want to introduce Dr. Melissa Clark. Dr. Clark, as I said, is renowned in D.C. for a number of different reasons, but her, her medical profession uh, was the um, dean of the School of Medicine at Howard University, College of Medicine, I should say. Is that you right? You just gave me a promotion. I just I gave you a promotion. Assistant dean. Assistant dean. <laughs> okay, well, I gave, I gave her a well-needed promotion, <laughs> <laughs> um, but was at the medical college at Howard University, and um, doc, Dr. Clark, just go ahead and take it away. I am so honored to be here with you. Thank you so much for introducing me, Ambrose. Uh, welcome to all the parents, as Dr. Tuxen said. You know, I know you all have been homeschooling and uh, spending lots of time in front of the computer. So to take the additional time tonight to be with us, um, I know is above and beyond, but you do it because you love your families, you love your children. And, you know, that's why I've been, I have a streaming show that I do every Monday night. Um, specifically to bring people information around their health, facts, figures, science, so that you can make informed decisions for you, your family, and of course that translates to your community. So I have to start off 
even though Dr. Tuxin and Ambrose have said it, just to set the context, because I can't really talk about just the vaccine in isolation without understanding why the need for the vaccine exists. And so about a year ago, this just this past week, the first case of COVID-19 was reported in the United States by the CDC. And since then, we've topped 25 million cases. We've topped 408,000 deaths. As Ambrose said here in the district, um, that's 895 deaths, souls lost to COVID-19, and almost 36,000 cases. Every day, there are roughly about 200,000 new cases in the United States. Roughly about 4,000 people die each day. And by Valentine's Day, we're going to probably top 500,000 cases. So that's the emergency that we are in as we start to think about what is the vaccine and should we take it? The next, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me start slideshow. I didn't do that. There we go. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is just how rapidly this coronavirus has spread. Because again, in order to sort of understand the science behind the vaccine, we have to kind of talk about how the COVID-19, how COVID-19 has come to disproportionately affect black and brown communities, two to three times the rate of death in the black and brown communities as um, Caucasian communities. And so when we talk about spread, we have to understand that spread comes from those who we are around and most often from those who we love. So as we talk about behaviors within our family, um, we're gonna have people who um, disproportionately work on the front lines, who work in restaurants, who work in transportation, who, who are essential workers in grocery stores that have to be there and have to be exposed to COVID-19 and then uh, to coronavirus. Um, and so they are most at risk for bringing the COVID-19 virus to their homes and potentially spreading it to vulnerable populations um, who they live with. And we understand the whole concept of silent spread. Those are people who have the virus, who feel totally fine and look totally fine, but are going to be the ones who are most likely to pass that along to their loved ones, to their friends and those who they're around. If you look at uh, coronavirus.dc.gov, uh, which is sort of the official coronavirus website for the district, you'll actually see contact tracing has told us that the most frequent places that people are getting the infection in public spaces are restaurants, childcare facilities, offices, and schools in that order. And so the more that the virus spreads, the more likelihood, the, the higher the likelihood that there will be changes in the virus. So what the virus does is it enters your body. It tells your cells, hey, I'm here. These are, these are the instructions to make more of me. Your body then uses its own machinery to make more of the virus, which then busts open that cell and kills it in the process and travels to the next cell in your body until it sort of takes over and that's when you start to feel sick. So the more times the virus is copied, the more chances are that there'll be changes or mutations in that virus. And so that's where you come up with these variants that we've heard about. We've had variants in the United States. There's in the UK, South Africa, Brazil, there are variants all over the world. But the two that have emerged most recently that are of concern are the UK variant and the uh, South African variant because they appear to be more contagious than the others. So they're likely going to take over from the other uh, varieties of this virus. And so these new variants have implications for how we should behave. So we have to double down on our distancing. We have to double down on our mask wearing and actually take it up a notch. And if we were wearing single layer masks, we have to make sure that our cloth masks are now at least double layer and have a filter which can be 
paper, a paper towel stuck in between the layers to give that extra uh, piece of protection. Um, so it's really important to mask and isolate if you're living with family members who, you know, are not abiding by the guidance of the CDC in terms of mask wearing and social distancing. If there is a known exposure, so they've been in contact with somebody who's had COVID-19, or if they have a high risk occupation if they work in healthcare. And high risk events, just as we talked about the high risk locations in the community, family celebrations, any large gatherings, I especially point out funerals because it's really hard to refrain from hugging those that we love and providing comfort. And then dining indoors, we saw restaurants were at the highest um, on that list. And that's because you can't dine indoors with a group of people without taking your mask off. And nine times out of 10, you're probably gonna be sitting close to them. And of course, the whole thing is to protect, protect, protect those individuals who are at highest risk. People with obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart or kidney disease, sickle cell disease, and HIV, just to name a few of those high-risk diseases. So now, in this context, we're now being asked to make decisions for ourselves and our families about taking the vaccine. I had to educate myself as a healthcare professional, but also I, make, I have to make the decision for my mom who has Alzheimer's, who can no longer make decisions for herself. So I, I, I tell you, um, when I make a recommendation about taking this vaccine, it's the same recommendation that I, and decision that I made for my mom, which is that she should take it and she's gonna be vaccinated for her first dose on February 11th. And I've already had my first dose. My second dose is going to be tomorrow. And I uh, had a mild headache. I took Tylenol and I had um, no other, you know, no other adverse um, effects from the virus. So before we start off to talk about the facts of the virus, I just want to mention that among African Americans, we've heard a lot about vaccine hesitancy. And Ambrose excellently ran down all the reasons for that. So I, I won't repeat it. But we're actually seeing that the, the needle is moving for a variety of reasons and that vaccine hesitancy is now turning into vaccine acceptance among more and more people um, in the African-American community. So a little bit about the science behind the vi vaccines. Vaccines in general, and I use this analogy because I'm talking to uh, parents and, and kids who know all about taking pop quizzes. So a lot of times, nine times out of 10, you're not gonna know you're gonna have a pop quiz and think of the pop quiz as being exposed to the coronavirus. So just imagine somebody came to you the night before your pop quiz and told you all the answers to the pop quiz, what time the pop quiz was gonna be and exactly how you should take the test, right? That's what the vaccine does. It prepares you, lets you let your body get a, opportunity for a dry run without you having to get sick so that when you're actually exposed to the coronavirus, your body knows exactly what to do to knock it out. A lot of people have been concerned about the fact that the vaccine was developed really quickly, but there are two things to know about that. The technology that allowed us to use genetic material or messenger RNA pre-existed the coronavirus outbreak. That they had been working on that delivery system for vaccines for over 10 years. And then when this opportunity came to apply it to an outbreak, that was one of the reasons along with the hundreds of labs that worked across the world on this problem and all the money that was pumped into it, that we were able to arrive at a solution that has been safe and effective in a record period of time. And you know, we're never afraid of technology, for example, when we're talking about the fact that we wear a computer on our wrist that many years ago would have required a whole room to house, right? So it's that level of sophistication in our technology that allowed us to be able to develop this particular way of delivering vaccines. 
it's 95%, 94 to 95% effective. And I put in parenthesis there, for African-Americans in the COVID-19 vaccine trials of Pfizer and Moderna, which are the data that we have and we've reviewed, 100% of the African-Americans who received the vaccine as opposed to the placebo, which was not the real vaccine, it's the comparison group, 100% of those people did not contract COVID-19. So there were actually better results among the 10% of African-Americans, uh, the 10% of the trial participants who were African-Americans in each trial. It's safe. So that means that most side effects from vaccines occur in the first two months. That's why the trial period observed people for two months before applying to the FDA for permission for emergency use. And as I mentioned, I got a headache. That's one of the side effects, body aches, chills, temperature, elevation. Those are also side effects, as well as a pain on where you got the vaccine. Those tend to last for no more than two to three days. And it actually means that the vaccine is working because remember, it's a pop quiz. It's your body practicing for the real deal. So the fact that you get those things is actually good. So, and then the older you get, so people in their 60s and 70s, the older you are, the less likely you are to have those side effects because the older you are, the less robust your immune system is to mount that, you know, really strong immune response. So that's why older people tend to get fewer side effects than younger people. Um, and then, you know, as, as Dr. Tuxen said, with all those statistics that I outlined, we're in a dire, dire place. And this vaccine represents the way out of the pandemic because it protects us, it helps our bodies get protection against COVID-19. Of importance though, it doesn't keep us from spreading the vaccine, I'm mean, sorry, spreading the virus to other people. So we can actually get the coronavirus. We won't have symptoms because our immune system will make sure of that, but we can still pass it on to other people. So even if we get vaccinated, we still have to wear our masks and isolate and distance from other people until we reach herd immunity. What's herd immunity? That's the level at which um, 80 to 90% of the population has been vaccinated. And so therefore they can no longer serve as a host, as a home to the vaccine, the, to, the, to the virus. So if the virus cannot exist in your body, it dies. So therefore herd immunity means that so many people have it that we can't pass the virus around anymore. I have some of just the popular misconceptions uh, and things that I've heard on social media. Realize that there has been a concerted effort by Russian bots to, pu to push conspiracy theories about vaccines into not just the black community, but many different communities. The black community is just one of the ones that have unfortunately experienced this onslaught of misinformation but it's not to put a chip in you. It has nothing to do with 5G. It doesn't make you sterile. So the messenger RNA, that genetic material, it cannot interact with your DNA. It's in a whole different compartment in the cell. So it can't even get to it to affect your DNA or affect your eggs or, or affect your sperm to make you sterile. It's not meant to kill you. Unfortunately, the virus is doing an excellent job of that in worldwide and especially disproportionately in black and brown communities. And I'll just end with this. For African-Americans, if we choose to not get vaccinated, that death gap that I mentioned will widen, but also the life gap will widen. What do I mean by that? Those activities like working, going to school, traveling, going on vacation, eventually, I believe it will get harder and harder to do that if you, if you have not been vaccinated. And so 
I encourage everyone, as we're thinking about the way to get out of this pandemic, consider to take the vaccine uh, because it is the best way for you and your family to stay healthy and for us all to end the pandemic. I'll Thank stop you. there and take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Clark. And um, there are some things that are coming up in the chat that I think need to be addressed. Uh, one of them was uh, just came up was uh, how long the vaccine, how long uh, COVID has been around. Uh, the person said that COVID has been around since the 60s, but it's actually been a lot longer than that. Um, and this is just the 19th strain and, and that's, that's not correct. Yeah, so uh, let me address that. COVID-19 means that it was, it, it came about in 2019. So that's what the 19 stands for. It doesn't mean that it's the 19th iteration. And coronaviruses have been around for a long time. The common cold is a coronavirus. However, this kind of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, or th that causes the disease COVID-19 has only been around since 2019. Uh, one, one point was that the virus doesn't contain the COVID, the vaccine doesn't contain the COVID-19 virus. Yes, it contains the genetic material or the instructions to make a very small part of the virus. So I'm gonna see if I, I actually don't have a picture of it. I thought I had a picture of the virus, but you know, the little spikes that you see, it contains the, gen, the instructions to make that spike. And the reason why is when a virus invades your body, and this is very important, when a virus invades your body, it has messenger RNA. That's how it gives your body the instructions to make more virus. So giving your, vi your body via the vaccine, the messenger RNA, basically mimics the exact thing that the, vi vaccine, that the virus does. The only difference is the virus delivers that, those instructions via a little protein. Uh, it's enclosed in a protein versus the vaccine encloses it in a little fat droplet. That's the main difference. Um, and so when it enters, it, it mimics basically what a real live um, infection is like. And then your body, instead of making the entire virus, only makes that one little piece, the little spike protein. And then when it gets manufactured and released into your system, your immune system then sees that as foreign, makes antibodies against it that can then neutralize it and basically gives your body a dry run of practicing how to fight the coronavirus, if it ever does have to. And, and one thing that I also wanted to mention was that one of the scientists that helped create the vaccine is an African-American woman. Her name is Dr. Kizmakia Corbett. She works at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, she is actually on Dr. Fauci's team and she was instrumental in helping to create the vaccine. And so that is another example of how African-American scientists and ingenuity uh, have been involved in this. And so um, we have to kind of dispel the, the myths that, you know, this was created in some lab somewhere to try to uh, uh, do something negative, do something bad to, to Black people across the country. No, uh, it was an African-American scientist. And, and in fact, um, one of the top uh, scientists uh, for the FDA is an African-American man out of uh, Meharry University, Meharry College, uh, medical college. And so, the dean. Uh, they, yeah, yes. And so uh, he is, he is actually on uh, the team that reviews the vaccines. And so at every step of the way, there are African-Americans involved in the science of the vaccine. Um, let's see if we can go to, uh, another, there was another point that was made about uh, how, um, uh, how masks don't protect us. Uh, it says, uh, I'll read it, it says, fact, humans breathe out carbon dioxide and breathe in oxygen. Mask wearing doesn't protect you. If we breathe in carbon dioxide, it will break down your immune system. 
Could you address that um, uh, misstatement? Sure. Um, so actually, before I address that, I just want to um, dip back for a second to Dr. Corbett. So myself and Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick of Grapevine Health had an opportunity to interview her just a couple of weeks ago. If you want to see that interview, go to grapevinehealth.com. Yeah, .com and you'll be able to see her interview. She's a, a wonderful person and it might be great for your kids to be able to also see her as well. Um, so regarding the masks, so it's been shown that in populations that mask, that the spread of coronavirus goes way down. We know that masks work. There's been a lot of misinformation about the fact that masks cut off your oxygen. They don't do that. For example, surgical masks and N95 masks, hospital personnel stay in those masks all day long and they do not fall out from lack of oxygen or from buildup of carbon dioxide in their body. As a matter of fact, I doubt that you would want a surgeon to operate on you, cut you open and have respiratory droplets from him or her dropping into your body because that causes infection. The way to prevent that, that has been done successfully for decades is the use of surgical masks. So we know that they work. Now I have seen something on the internet that tries to say that masks don't work because there's this guy who um, takes a drag on a cigarette and then puts a mask on and then blows it out and you see all the smoke going everywhere. And so there, therefore he says masks don't work. Understand that the qualities, the, the chemical qualities of smoke and the qualities of your saliva, your respiratory droplets that carry the coronavirus in it are very different. One's a lot lighter and airier and the other is heavier. And so the mask effectively blocks that. We know that masks work. Um, also, uh, there was a question about uh, and, and I can I can take this one, a question about those who have already tested positive for COVID taking the vaccine. Yes, you can uh, take the vaccine even if you have tested positive for COVID. In fact, uh, it's recommended that you definitely uh, take the vaccine even if you have been tested positive, if you have tested po positive for COVID. The only time that the, uh, the vaccine is not recommended is, is if you were already involved in a vaccine trial. And so uh, Pfizer and Moderna uh, are the two vaccine companies, vaccine producing companies. Um, but uh, there are other companies that are still doing uh, in, in taking people to be involved in vaccine trials. Uh, and vaccine trials, and Howard University is actually one of them, vaccine trials are when a, when a person signs up for a vaccine trial, they go and they get a vaccine or they get what's called a placebo. Um, and that is to test the effectiveness of the vaccine that they are producing. Um, could you, Dr. Clark, talk a, a little bit about the difference between the Moderna vaccine, uh, the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, and other types of vaccines? Absolutely. So what the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine have in common is they're both this genetic material messenger RNA that's enclosed in a fat droplet. Um, what they're different is, the differences are, is that the Pfizer vaccine needs to be stored at a much lower temperature. Um, and so that's why you see it being distributed mainly through hospitals that have special freezers that, that go to you know, minus 40, minus 90 degrees. The Moderna vaccine just requires regular freezers and regular refrigeration. So it can be more widely disseminated in the community because it doesn't need that special refrigeration. The other difference is that the um, Moderna vaccine, uh, the, the interval between the first and the second shot is 28 days versus Pfizer is 21 days. And then the third difference is that the Pfizer vaccine was administered to um, individuals 16 years of age and older, whereas Moderna was done for 18 years of age and older. That's the, the folks who were in the clinical trials. So therefore, if you have a 16 year old, you would prefer that they get the, um, the Pfizer vaccine. Now, the difference between that and the subsequent ones that are coming down the pike, 
For example, to, to mention of note is the Johnson & Johnson one that's still in clinical trials. It only requires one dose as opposed to two doses. Um, it too is a um, uh, genetic vaccine, but it and Novavax and some of the other ones don't use messenger RNA, they use DNA. And the DNA is in another kind of virus that doesn't cause COVID and doesn't make you sick. Um, and so it goes, it goes into your body and basically delivers the genetic information, the instructions to make the spike protein uh, specifically. So th that's the main difference between the two that already, already have been approved and the ones that are being developed. Okay. One of the other uh, points that was brought up is uh, whether or not uh, you should get a test prior to the vaccine. So uh, we encourage you to get tested. Uh, you know, now you can be asymptomatic, which means that you won't have any symptoms and still have COVID-19. Um, but so we encourage everybody to get a test, but the test does not prevent you from getting the vaccine. If you have not gotten a COVID-19 test, you can still get the vaccine. One does not have to come before the other. Um, and so that was to answer that question. Uh, let me see if there are any other questions in the chat. Um, oh yes, this was um, one from Facebook and, and the thoughts on the potential long-term effects of the vaccine since we haven't been able to study the vaccine long enough. So as I mentioned, historically, it, um, side effects from vaccines occur in the first two months after they've been given. That's why the observation period was two months before they applied for, for phase three for both trials for Pfizer and Moderna before they applied to the FDA. But keep in mind, they've actually been observing people since phase one, which was over nine months ago. And they're continuing to observe people. It's been two more months since that initial group of people who they observed for two months um, uh, for emergency use authorization, um, uh, you know, were, had, had applied. So it's been a total of four months for that cohort of people. Um, and there are two main kinds of, uh, uh, of side effects beyond the effects that I already mentioned of the fevers and chills and the um, pain at the injection site. Um, one is allergic reaction. And the good news is that the rate of allergic reactions that we've seen, although the ones that have happened get a lot of publicity, is very, very, very low. We're seeing um, uh, of the 20 million uh, uh, doses already given, they've estimated just a rate for the Pfizer vaccine of 11 per million allergic reactions, and for the um, Moderna, four per million uh, allergic reactions. So, and, and nobody has died. Uh, the other thing that people are always um, cautious about is the fact that viruses, viral infections, can cause inflammation of your nervous system. Again, that occurs within a week or two after getting over a viral infection. And so people are always concerned, well, can a vaccine cause this? And you may have heard of diseases like Bell's palsy, Guillain-Barre, transverse myelitis. Those are examples of inflammation of the nervous system. In the vaccine trials, they saw those issues, but they were at the same rate as happens in the regular population, whether they had gotten a vaccine or not. So it doesn't look like there's any increased association of those types of side effects with this vaccine. Beyond that, I don't know of any other long-term effects that would be revealed by a longer waiting period. Historically, we haven't seen any with other vaccines. And so uh, one other piece, uh, just to answer real quick, is was to whether or not um, you can still pass on the coronavirus even after being vaccinated. And the answer to that question is yes. The, the vaccine doesn't uh, keep you from getting coronavirus. What the vaccine does is that it prevents you from getting sick from coronavirus. Um, but you can still be a carrier. And so you that, that means that even 
uh, during and after this vaccination period, it's, it's still gonna be required to wear masks. It's still gonna be required to wash your hands and social distance to a certain extent. And so um, you don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that yes, hey, I got the vaccine, so I'm okay. Well, you may be a carrier that can pass it on to someone who did not get the vaccine. And so you still have to wear your mask to prevent that from happening. Um, let's see, you talked about the comparisons between Pfizer and Moderna. I am going to um, try to get one or two more questions in. Uh, would it be beneficial to get an antibody test if you've had COVID prior to getting the vaccine? Um, no, because, you know, natural immunity does wane and it's been um, shown that if you get a COVID-19 vaccine, a coronavirus vac vaccine, that that will actually boost whatever immunity you already have. So it will be additive as opposed to um, anything that would take away from what you've already attained. So people who've had it are encouraged whether they have antibodies or not. And uh, one other question, this is a good one. Um, if you've had COVID-19, wouldn't your body already make the antibodies to beat COVID? So why do we get a vaccine to mimic defeating COVID? So it's been shown that people who get vaccinations are actually, they have a more robust immune response than those people who have acquired immunity naturally. And again, as I mentioned before, it's additive. So it gives you an additional boost even when your natural immunity has already started to wane. Okay, um, someone said that uh, this is a gamble that I or my child will not be taking. We need healthy alternatives, not injections. And I don't even, I don't know what exactly that really means. Uh, there is no vaccine, there is no vaccination for children, by the way. Um, but there's one thing that you do need to be aware of, and that is the South African strain of the coronavirus appears to be more uh, impactful on young people and children. Um, that strain has not made its way to the United States yet. The UK strain has, the UK, both strains are more contagious. The UK strain, they don't know for sure, but they think that it might be deadlier, but the South African strain is known to affect children more, but that hasn't come to the United States yet. And I, I would also add this to Ambrose, I think those are excellent points, that the gamble that when you mention taking a gamble on the vaccine, you by default are taking a gamble on the coronavirus. And we know that the coronavirus affects children. Um, and we, we also know that it's not just you that might be affected, it's your ability also to pass that on to other people who you might be around who are more vulnerable than you are, who have pre-existing conditions or who um, are over 65. So when we talk about taking the vaccine, it's not, again, just it, it benefits you, but it also benefits the entire community and helps us get back to being able to earn a living, being able to end food insecurity and to be able to cut down on the death rates that we're seeing from, uh, from COVID-19. So um, I, I would also encourage you to consider those things as well. There are two last questions. Uh, one being, is the vaccine safe for pregnant and nursing women? Does it have effects for a baby uh, in vitro? And then the last question is, um, how long will the vaccine last? So for children uh, and for pregnant women, there are trials ongoing. However, just anecdotally, um, the day that I got my first vaccine, you know, there's a waiting period of 15 to 30 minutes after just to make sure that you're fine after you get the vaccine. And one of the people waiting with me was a obviously pregnant woman. woman. She was eight months pregnant. Uh, she's actually due in February. And she said that she talked with her doctor and they decided together that it would be a good idea for her to take it 
because the risks of COVID-19 to a pregnant woman exceed that of the regular population, especially when it comes to blood clots and blood clots affecting your lungs or causing a stroke or causing a heart attack. And so for that reason, she felt that it was more important to get the vaccine than to take the risk of getting COVID. Um, so that, and please tell me the, the last uh, question. How long will the vaccine last? We're still figuring that out because um, again, we do know that the people who are in the phase one trial, it's been about nine months and they're still going strong in terms of their immunity. So we know that it lasts for at least nine months. Oh, this is a good question because this, this is something that I've uh, covered in my work in terms of advocacy. I got to slip this question in. As parents, do we as parents have the right to say no to the vaccine or are we beholden to the science? And, and I'll start off by saying you always want to follow the science, but it is not, uh, it is not something that is mandatory to anyone. Um, however, it, in, in our view, from the science of it, it would be foolish not to take it. Now, there was a recent bill passed in the District of Columbia Council that allowed for someone as young as 11 to be able to get a vaccine. And yes, the coronavirus vaccine is on the list, the federal list of vaccines. Uh, and an 11 year old could request it with or without the knowledge of the parent. Um, and if that, if that goes through Congress and there's like a few days left for the congressional review, because um, the mayor did not sign it, but if it goes through the congressional review, it becomes law and uh, the, the parent will never know. If, if an 11 year old says, I wanna get the coronavirus to a doctor and understands the coronavirus a vaccine, the doctor will give it to her and um, the parent will never know. So hope that covers it. <laughs> so we're, at, we're out of time. Can um, I just add two yes. very quick things? Yes. The messenger RNA, the genetic material that I mentioned that's in the virus, I mean, in the vaccine, it gets destroyed in a matter of minutes after it enters your cell and does its job. So as far as long-term side effects, it's very unlikely that any effect can persist as a result of the vaccine because the agent of the vaccine gets destroyed so quickly. And number two, it's Black History Month coming up. An African American actually introduced the concept of vaccines into the United States in the 1700s. Um, and I wanted, his name is Onesimus. And I think it's really important to know the role that we as African Americans have played in the advancement of science in this country. And as homage and respect to them, um, I think it's also important that we not focus on the misinformation and the disinformation, but focus on the science. And uh, someone asks about the website. The website is Black Coalition Against COVID. I put it in the chat for all panelists and attendees. If you go to that website, you could see my interview with Dr. Fauci on vaccines. You could see the interview with uh, Dr. Kismakia Corbett uh, about the vaccines. Um, and you can see a wealth of other information that will really inform you um, about the coronavirus and about vaccines. That's blackcoalitionagainstcovid.org. It is in your chat. And uh, Jacques, go ahead and take it away. All right. Um, I don't know what to say. I mean, this has just been an awesome evening for everyone. I truly appreciate um, the coalition coming here and speaking with our families, with our school leaders, with our educators. Um, at one particular time, we knew we had 120 questions that had been sent in. So you guys have been well received and you guys have uh, given a lot of knowledge, expert knowledge on what's true and what's not true concerning the vaccine. Um, I wanna thank everybody who did come out and really you know, listen, because this is such an important endeavor for our community, specifically BIPOC communities that have suffered the most um, during this pandemic. Um, we appreciate you guys. Um, definitely we'll stay in contact with you. For those who want to follow up with this, you're welcome to contact me or Brandon as well. And we'll also reach out to the uh, Black Coalition against um, COVID and make sure that questions can be answered. 
Um, and we may need you guys to come back again. So I'm, I'm gonna just put that out there because you guys have done such an excellent job and because there were so many questions and because it is so important that we continue to get the word out about this vaccine. So I wanna thank everybody for coming out this evening. Again, um, KIPP is going to continue to make sure that the community is aware of what is true and what is not true, uh, dispelling myths um, as we try to make sure that our community is safe and those who we care about and our families, we're going to continue to work with you and we just appreciate everyone who came tonight. So thank you. I don't know if Brandon has any final words because Brandon, I wanna give him all his credit for pulling this together. If you have any final words whatsoever, Brandon, I wanna give you that opportunity. If not, we can end this evening. Go right ahead, Brandon. Yeah, no, uh, no, no extra words um, over here. I just wanna say thank you all for giving us your time. Um, uh, Dr. Clark has put in some additional information. I know that there are some people who were still, who had some questions. Um, feel free to reach out to us. Feel free to reach out to them. Um, I know that uh, Ambrose uh, said that they are gonna be doing some things in the future. So feel free to reach out to Ambrose Lane over at his, e I mean, with Black Coalition Against COVID.org. Um, and just let's continue to stay informed about this and uh, everyone just have a great night. And, and, and I'll put my email in the chat right now if anyone wants to get in contact with me. Okay. So if we can leave this up just for a little while so those who want to get this information can get this information. But uh, Dr. Clark, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Nothing against you, uh, Ambrose, but Dr. Ambrose. But she just was killing it. She, she was killing it. <laughs> so I got to give her a prop. She was killing it tonight. Uh, so thank you so much. And we're going to leave this up for just a little while. But for those who would like to sign off, we're signing off at this particular time. Thank you for spending time with us this evening and, and going a little bit over with us. So thank right, you. Have a great night, thank you, everyone. All right, take thank care. You. Ambrose, thanks a lot for setting this up, man. Very welcome. Very welcome.